Hello, Gary Calgary here today. I'd like to talk to you about string instruments and myths and truths about them. Uh, here lately, I've been asked some questions about a lot of the string instruments that I uh, play. And to be honest with you, uh, I only play maybe a couple of them uh, that I usually use, and that's uh, fiddles and banjos. And I have various different types of fiddles and banjos that I play. And everybody will say, well, I thought they was all the same. No, they're not. Uh, as we today think of a banjo, we think of bluegrass back in the uh, early days of uh, country music and everything. Well, the banjo goes way back beyond that. It goes way back beyond the United States was even the United States. It goes way back. And what I'm saying there, the banjo was not a natural instrument of the United States. It was brought here through Africa. It was a uh, African tribal instrument used in worship. And the banjo at that time was not like the banjo we see today. It did not have a hoop ring around it. It did not have a lot of fancy hardware on it or anything like that. I wish I had one of the banjos like that. But the banjos they used that was brought here, first brought here, was made out of gourds. They had a gourd back on it with the skin stretch across the top as the head on it. And usually they was maybe four string, counting the drone string. They'd have three long strings and one short string as a drone string. But the banjo as of today that they use in bluegrass uh, has five strings. And the finger style picking of the gourd banjo before bluegrass was usually a downstroke with using the thumb on the drone string. And usually what I call claw hammer uh, picking. But uh, the uh, roll three finger style picking didn't come around until lesser flat neural scrubs come about. They are the ones that the, the start playing, especially with Lester Flat. Uh, there were scrubs there, they was both a team there at one time. But when I'm uh, trying to get the point across, a lot of people say, oh, it is too hard to play banjo. No, it's not. You know, if you have any kind of uh, ability of playing an instrument at all, you can play a banjo. I, uh, just a regular old type of a banjo. Now, I have various different sizes uh, here of banjos. Now, I have one here. It is the long neck banjo right here. A long neck banjo. And I play it quite a bit. But this is a long neck banjo right here. And uh, you do not have to have that three finger picking style. You know, it can be... It's a regular old flat, flat, you know, what they call plectrum picking, you know, and and I know it's out too. It's all down with the thumb or up with the thumb. It's nothing like that. But this is mostly the common banjo which you would see uh, like this. And there's other various different types. I have uh, many different types of banjos that I use. I have 
one here that I'm pretty fond of. And uh, I use it every now and then in church, as well as a long neck. But this is called an Irish tenor banjo. It's a four-string banjo right here. And this one here is an antique. This is a 1920 Gretsch clarophone. And this banjo here was uh, mostly used by the Irish. And you see it in a lot of minstrel bands back then, what they call blackface minstrel bands. And it was uh, a lot of Irish music played on. And, uh, tenor banjo and most of your Irish use them banjos right there because there's a plectrum type picking on it and they tune different ways and right now I got this one tuned uh, the open G style which was G D G B style like I, I like to tune you know for here in Appalachian then we're gonna go a little bit farther back on it. Now I have to go around here because I got my banjo strung all over the place in the living room right now. Now this particular banjo here I built myself. I built all the hardware and the neck and everything on it. But this is a fretless banjo. It is made fretless. And while I'm saying there's no frets up and down this neck, there's no markers to tell anybody where to put their fingers. And I use nylon gut strings on this. But it is uh, also tuned in open tuning. But uh, a lot of your Appalachian on down through the years and everything, most of the early banjos did not have frets on them at all. Even the gourd banjos did not have frets on them. But uh, it... Uh fretless banjo. This one here, I, like I said, I made myself. I even put a, uh, a West Virginia Porter on it there. You can see the New River Bridge on it there because it's made here in West Virginia. 
And this is somewhat what they call closed gap back. Or the gap in there where it's closed on the back. That lets a little bit of the air pressure out off the drum head. And then we're going to be moving on. We're going to be going back a little further in time. We're going to go back to my ancestors. This is a, uh, a relative of mine named Jambalaya Calgar. Let's get some light on if we can here. His name is Jambalaya Calgar. And you notice the banjo that he has got in his arms there. That is a fretless mountain banjo. And yes, he has a pistol. Uh, he was... Uh, Born in 18, or, yeah, 1891. But uh, he was a bootlegger, from what I found out. But that is a fretless banjo that he has in his arms there. And he also was a Confederate, too. His family, my family, is all Confederate. But now, we'll get to the part there. That set my cousin Jambalaya back up on the mantel so he didn't get broke. <clears throat> this right here is a fretless mountain banjo. This banjo right here. Fretless mountain banjo. Now I got this set up as a tenor fretless mountain banjo. Most of your heads on these, these this part right here was either calf, goat, or groundhog hide skins on. This head right here is a groundhog head skin on it. Tanned and uh, uh, ground up groundhog hide skin on it there. And as you can tell, the wear marks over here on this side, you can tell I played a good bit. Because I like the old-fashioned Appalachian music. Now, this this part right here, these tuning uh, keys here are not original what they had on. I put them on there just to make it a little easier. Usually they have what they call peg head screws, like a uh, violin. But I also have a, uh, as you can see, it's an Indian head on there because most of the indians in west virginia were cherokee but as you can hear it has a totally different sound a mountain banjo right there these uh go back in the 1800s late 1800s on up to the 1900s a lot of people likes to call them a west virginia banjo a lot of them was fretless too a lot of them didn't have frets i put frets on this one because i 
play at church and I play it in different places at meetings and stuff like that. But now, <clears throat> we're going to get into something a little bit more stranger. <clears throat> This is a little bit more stranger. I made this one myself too. This is called a tin top banjo. Fretless. Got the old style tuner keys on. This is an old style. fretless banjo, like the other one I had. But this is a tin top. People says they've never seen a tin top banjo. Oh yeah. Back during the Civil War, hides was hard to get hold of. They were using during the Civil War to make chaps, leathers, uh, powder pouches, you know, all kinds of stuff. So... The uh, hides is hard to get a hold of. <clears throat> Even deer hide was hard to get, any kind of hide. A lot of people starved during the uh, 1800s. A lot of widows, because all their men folk was off during the war. So they ate about everything that come along, including birds, too. But this is a tin top banjo. And what most of them would do, would tack on a, uh, they cut an oil can. They had oil cans back then, uh, the cooking oil come in, or lard oil come in, and they'd cut the cans open, and then they would cut them around into a fashion and put them on the head of the banjo. Then they put a uh, ring on the inside to make it come tight. And a lot of people would, it wouldn't sound very loud. Well, let's see what she does. Tin top fretless banjo. Right there. Oh, then people, they said, well, what's that here on top right there? Well, that is a piece of apple wood. I carved it down round. That is my capo. If I want to go someplace and play music with somebody, and I'm tuned to G, and they're playing an A or B flat, or D or something like that, I can slide this down like that and go into a C or D flat or something. <laughs> Let's go a little bit more modern. 
a lot of people start to get into uh, ukuleles and what have you. And uh, of course, ukuleles has been around for centuries. But this get into a ukulele banjo. <coughs> I have several different styles of these also. But this is a four string ukulele banjo. Right here. And it is tuned like a ukulele. Only I put a low G string on it. Right there instead of being like that. But anyhow, these started getting popular, the banjo type ukulele, in the roaring 20s. Uh, barbershop quartets, if you ever watch a lot of barbershop quartet uh, people play music, this was just about the main instrument they used. Uh, some of your bluegrass bands, but most of your uh, bands, you know, that really stood out, you know, they liked something that had a lot of projection to it. And these was loud for their size and their year and everything. But this is what this sounds like. Now you gotta kind of get all crunched up. Well, let's see here if I can. <laughs> That is a ukulele banjo, right there. Very small, very compact, easy to put down in your backpack, take it with you, travel along. <clears throat> a lot of people like to play in these now, but they was very, very, very popular during the 20s and uh, the 30s there, uh, early 30s. But like I said, a lot of your barbershop quartet played these. And it's a very versatile instrument, I thought. Very cute little instrument to have, too. So there you go. That is a ukulele banjo. Very tiny there. Now, let's get to our fiddles. Most of the fiddles, uh, they come, they come from Italy. A lot of your fiddles come from Italy. And I have a Sophia Maria here, three-quarter size, but still, you know, she's a very good playing instrument. <clears throat> a lot of people, when they hear violin, you know, here in the South, we call them fiddles. That's just how we are here in the South, in Appalachia. But this violin right here, they, uh, it really come to life during the uh, 1700s, early 1700s, we're talking early, early, right around 1704, Stradivarius, Antonio Stradivarius, yes, they are a high-priced uh, violin. Uh, I think he died in, he was, I think he was born in 17, or I think he started making them in 1704, and he died in 1765. Someone correct me on that if I'm wrong. But violins has been around that long. And a lot of your Irish, Scots-Irish, your German people love to play 
the violin, but it was called a fiddle, you know, when we come here and stuff. And a lot of the uh, old fiddles and stuff, you know, versatile music, classical music, orchestra music, hymns, you know, country music, bluegrass music, you know, folk music. Everybody had a fiddle, one part or another, in some of the bands. It's like the old uh, song goes, if you're going to play in Texas, you got to have a fiddle in a band. You know, that's one of the things there, so. But, uh, you know, they're not that hard to play. Now, I got this tuned in the Appalachian style. It's an open uh, tuning on with G, D, G, D. You know, I like because I play a lot of Scotch-Irish music and stuff, but... violins, you know, Scots Irish playing, you know, like I said, here in Appalachian, we like to call them a fiddle. Had an argument with the guy in the music store the other day. No, fiddle and violins, tea, totally two different things. No, they're about, they're the same thing. <clears throat> it just depends on where you come from. But that's the regular style, which you usually see when you hear fiddle or violin, this is what you see. Now, taking that on another note, this, this get to Appalachian now. now I'm going to show you an Appalachian fiddle. A lot of people back then did not have fancy ways of making curves and stuff like that. And here's what usually happened. When, they, uh, when a settlement was being built, in the 1700s, early, early 1800s, they, first thing they done, they got their gardens all in, living in tents or lean tooth or whatever, built their houses and stuff. Then the next thing that come along was usually a fiddle. But this is what you call an Appalachian fiddle. The style, most of the styles like this. Of course, I got newer type tuners on, but they was made in a fashion, something like that in the body. That was made out of the Foxfire uh, magazine. But I also had this tune in the Scots-Irish also. And this one here had a little bit different sound. That's a type of fiddle I had back during the 1800s, late or early 1800s and 1700s when the settlers first come here mostly. Like I said, they didn't have a whole lot of resources or anything. They had mostly planers and a few saws and whittling knives, and they would come out with stuff like this. But like I said, you put your mind to it. If you really want to do it, you can make a lot of these instruments I was showing you here. But we'll play a song here. He's a distant cousin of mine, Ernie Carpenter. 
He's from Webster, and he had a house on the Elk River there in uh, Webster there. And the Elk River uh, led in to Sutton, which was the Sutton Dam. And during the 1950, the Army Corps of Engineers was going to dam up that river to cut down on the flooding downstream. And a lot of the people tried to fight the Army Corps of Engineers because a lot of the houses that was there off the river was going to be flooded over. And Ernie Carpenter's house was one of them. Well, he fought long and hard, but of course, you know how we go. We lose if we try to fight the government. But he uh, composed a song for a fiddle that uh, is very haunting. It's very sad sounding. But hey, if your house is getting flooded over, you'd probably be sad sounding too. So this is what sounds something like this. Ernie Carpenter wrote that song, composed it on the fiddle. So, this ends this little thing here, a little bit of history on the music that I like to play. Most of the music is gospel I play, a lot of Scotch-Irish music. And there's usually stories behind the Scotch-Irish music, too, when I play it. You all take care now. God bless. Take it easy out there. Don't get stuck in snow if it snows around you. Bye-bye.